Good morning. Well, all you have to do to know you have too much stuff is move. Those sermons about having too much stuff. Boy, I'm the leader. One of the things that we really wanted to do is downsize in the last couple years. And the amazing, the things that I thought I couldn't live without. I, I've had a motorcycle since I was able to walk, and I don't miss it. I don't miss it. It was amazing because not only put my house up for sale, but I walked out the middle of my court and my neighbor bought my boat. <laughs> and I don't miss it. And uh, it, it's amazing how much stuff we can accumulate. One of the things that we really want to do is we... We wanted to have a swimming pool because we want to do baptisms at home. Daryl and Julie have been so sweet to make their home available, and Daryl and Julie found me a home so they wouldn't have to do it. <laughs> uh, so we're really excited. We were going to try and have a baptism this month, you guys, but there's nothing left of me this month. So um, we have, like, thank you to Julie, 12 more days to be out of our house. She thought I had enough time to get us some time back because I didn't make my schedule because um, I had too much stuff. But we're, we'll, we'll look at next month of starting getting on a date and we'll get our um, first baptism in, in, in our home. You guys didn't want to get in the Delta. I don't blame you. So uh, it's pretty exciting. And so that's kind of where we've been for a couple of weeks. Do you know, I love peace. I hate conflict. I... I when I'm not overtired, I will do anything not to have conflict. I, I, it just isn't worth battling. I, I love, when there's something going on where there's conflict with someone in my life, I don't rest. I always want to figure out, how can I make this right? How can I not have this type of conflict? I, I, I avoid it in any way that I can. And in the church, especially, there should be peace. There should never be conflict. And it's hard because throughout history we'll see in the church there's always been conflict. And I gotta tell you, when we started the church, we had a lot of people that were coming from other churches and a lot of people with a lot of different ideas of what this church would be. And I, you know, when we set the church up, we knew what it was supposed to be. I had experienced enough churches and enough places and enough things. I knew what I wanted to protect this church from and, and what I wanted to do. And it was hard for people because they couldn't understand what I was doing. And I would try to share the vision of what I was doing. But I, I go to pastor's conferences. I quit going to them where all the local pastors show up and they have a luncheon. And I tell them what I'm doing here and they just look at me like they're numb. What do you mean? You're not doing a growth program. What do you mean you're not in the newspaper? What do you mean you're not doing this? And I just said, look, from the beginning, my priority was to teach God's word, to live it to the greatest example that I was capable with the power of the Holy Spirit in my life and to love on people. And, and, and that's what we wanted to do. And that when people came and heard the word of God taught simply, it would change their lives, and they would bring people, and you guys have. None of you read a newspaper article to come. None of you saw anything that brought you here other than a neighbor or friend. When life changes, it should cause change in other lives. And throughout the years, those that finally didn't like what we were doing here kind of sifted out, and those that liked what we were doing here stayed, and God's just worked through it. And, and actually, we have little to no problems with these issues, but we have lived through some of these issues in the past. And I happen to know that whenever things are kind of quiet, enjoy it because something's around the corner. The, the enemy's an expert at hitting you when you're tired from your moving. I know the other day with Valerie poor thing, she came in and it was like da 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 da, and I, I didn't answer the way I should have. And uh, so I just said, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. She goes, yeah, you're always right. And I'm going, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm wrong for the way I handled that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, the enemy knows how to throw this stuff out of you when, you when you're not, you know, 
filled with the Holy Spirit and sweet and wonderful. Um, so, you know, there are times for all of us where we're not doing this thing perfectly and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. But I read a story and, and I just loved it. You know, I'm always stealing stuff from other people, but when it's good, why not? I had a pastor that used to say, if the bullets fit in your gun, shoot it. And so, um, the story of a, a, a poor, simple woman who visited an upper-class, sophisticated church. And after attending for some time, she applied for church membership. Her application was rejected over and over. She sent a second one a month later, third one, a fourth one. She went to the chairman of the membership committee and said, why are my applications being rejected? He told her, you need to go home and pray. I think the Lord will show you what the real issues are. Well, a few late years later go by and the chairman sees her scrubbing floors in a hotel lobby and he said to her, you haven't made application for membership lately. In fact, I don't think I've seen you in church at all. Tell me, when I sent you home to pray, did God speak to you? Why, yes, she said. He did. He told me not to feel bad about being rejected because he's been trying to join your church for over 20 years. The bullet fit in my gun. I love it when someone comes up and goes, how do I join the church? I say, come, come, come. I'm not going to do a membership here. If you come to church, you know, you, and, and you serve and you, and you tithe, you, you're, you're one of the members. You bought in, you have bought in, you know. I, I had this gentleman, he was a tough man. He's an ex-policeman, um, I did his funeral. But he came a couple times and he sat in the back and he quit coming. And I said, why aren't you coming, you know? He goes, oh, those people at your church, they come in shorts and sandals and they're just not respectful. And, and how do you put up with that? And I'm going, I don't care if they come in their underwear. If they'll come and hear the word of God, I don't care how they dress. It has nothing to do. You know, let me bring you up to some news here. They didn't wear suit and ties in Jesus' day. You know, they didn't. I mean, if you want to wear a suit and tie to our church, bless your heart. I don't want to do a suit and tie if I have to marry you. <laughs> Nothing makes me happier when someone says, you know, I need you to do a service for me. I need you to do a wedding for me. Wear a Hawaiian shirt. I'm just going, I think I love you. <laughs> when your neck is this short and this wide, you don't want a suit and tie. Disunity has always been a major problem with God's people. It's the problem with the world we live in, but you wouldn't think it'd be a problem with God's people. The Old Testament records civil wars and family fights among the people of Israel. And almost every church mentioned in the New Testament had divisions. Um, the Corinthians were divided over human leaders and some of the members even suing each other. The Galatians were backbiting and devouring one another. The church in Ephesus and Colossae had to be reminded the importance of, commun of Christian community. In the church of Philippi, two women were at odds with each other and they almost blew up the whole church. The believers in Rome were divided over special diets and special days. Some of the members thought it was a sin to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. Others thought that they should just eat vegetables. Other members thought it was a sin to observe, not to observe Jewish holidays. If each Christian had kept their own convictions to themselves, there wouldn't have been a problem. But they began to criticize each other, judge one another. The one group was sure that other group was not spiritual at all. Unfortunately, we have similar problems today within some areas of the churches. What's right and what's wrong to every believer? Now, some activities we absolutely know are wrong because the Bible tells us that. But there's other activities that we just don't know. They're not clear. We find ourselves needing guidance, and that's what chapter 14's about. Paul's dealing with these issues. Like I said, things are really smooth and quiet right now. Nobody's mad at me, and I don't know any of you that are mad at you, and I'm loving that. And that's why a chapter like this might just keep us right there. Chapter 14, Romans 14, chapter 1, excuse me. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. 
Now here's something interesting, because when I read this and taught this years and years ago, who's the weak one here? The first time I read it, it was a big surprise to me. Read closely. Verse 2. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. The weaker Christian, as we're going to see, is the one who seems to be the most morally upright, the one who is most rigid and disciplined, the one who appears to have the highest standard of conduct. That's interesting, isn't it? Verse 3. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. Receive the weaker brother or sister, Paul says. Receive the one who is religious, the one who is uptight, the one that's always looking down on others. Don't engage in controversy with them. Just understand they're the weaker brother and sister. And because the next verse, part of the verse says, for God has accepted them. Don't you realize that God is not worried about a lot of things that we get upset about? Now again, I'm not talking about outright sin. I'm talking about things that people fight over, things that people debate. I, um, I have brothers in the faith that I've known for years that are in a different church right now. That the church believes that if you don't have church on Saturday, you might not even be saved and want to argue over those things. The Father's agenda many times is a whole lot different than our own. Sad to say the things that shock us most are insignificant when compared to the bigger issues of eternity. Sometimes we get so engaged in hair splitting we can miss the big picture entirely. I know that God doesn't fret about most of the things that we debate endlessly about. I, um, I have a brother in the faith for years that got so tied into Calvinism that he won't even keep a relationship with me anymore. I ask, can we agree to disagree? In my heart of heart, there's no way I know that God would condemn someone without any choice, that God would create someone to be condemned. Choice is part of every part of the Bible. God knows how it turns out. He knows everything. But for God, a loving father, everything about the Bible tells us that God is love and how that type of theology can be so powerful that they, they can no longer listen to what I'm teaching and no longer have me as a friend is just mind-boggling to me. God is concerned about people being saved. He's given you and me that responsibility he could have used angels. He could have done anything he wanted. He chose you and me. It's the reason we're still on this earth. There's no reason for us to be here anymore because moving's too difficult. I will die in this house. <laughs> Daryl and Julie, you're never selling me another house. This is it, okay? I will die in this house. Now again, please understand as I'm teaching this, I'm not talking about things that God has called sin. Okay, the Bible's very clear about those because people can start justifying their lifestyles and stuff by this message and that's not what this message is about. I think where I am as a Christian today as opposed to 25 years ago, 50 years ago. When I ran my dad's athletic club and I was you know, training for Mr. California and all the bodybuilding and all the stuff that went on with all that, there were guys at the gym that found out I was a pastor and they almost fell over. Who I am as a human being today compared to the years of my life, it's so easy where you are today to look at everybody else and think that they have to be at your standard. You know, there, there are people that, that I, I pour into, that I spend time with, that they can't get through a sentence without using the F-bomb, you know? But I look at where they were a year ago, and it's not even close. So am I going to be so hung up 
because something they've learned to say since they were kids, I'm not going to associate with them? Because how many of us were that before? Why would we put barriers between us and people that are growing in the Lord, that are learning? You know, we should be growing them and encouraging them, not, not, not separating ourselves from them or keeping them from growing. Verse four, who are you to condemn someone else's servants? They're responsible to the Lord, so let him judge whether they are right or wrong. And with the Lord's help, they will do what is right and will receive his approval. The word judgment is, is, is under the judgment seat. In the Greek, it's a bima. It means a place that a judge stood in athletic games. If during the game they saw an athlete break the rules, they immediately disqualified that person. At the end of the contest, that same judge would give out rewards. Isn't it great that God is the one that does that and not us? Isn't it? Aren't you glad God himself holds up others we might think will never make it. But we fail the factor of God's grace, his mercy, his faithfulness to see people all the way through. I am not the same human being I was then, nor would I want to be. But I'm so grateful for the grace of the believers that held me up, helped me grow, Teach me, set the example for me. Think about, I love this, John 21, 15 through 25. We can always use Peter because we see Peter in ourselves. But Jesus has just restored Peter from denying him. Jesus saying, may I go to hell if I know that man, to a little girl. This is what Peter's done with Jesus. And and so he's restored. And what does Jesus tell him? Follow me, Peter. Follow me. Well, Peter begins to follow Christ. Then Peter hears some talking behind him, and it's Jesus talking to John. And then Peter goes to Jesus, Lord, what are you going to do with this guy? And notice the Lord's reply. What is it to thee? Follow me. In other words, Peter, you make sure you've made things right with me in your life. Let me worry about John. And that's for us. You know, it's so easy to go, that person's never going to make it. That person's a loser. That person's never going to be a good Christian. That person, (laughs) that's not our place. Our place is to uphold that person, to raise that person, to lovingly share. Look, I had the worst language in the world. I ran an athletic club. I was in construction. I don't know if I had a sentence without an F-bomb. I hit my thumb a couple times and nothing came out. God's a work in us, you know? God's a work in us. Verse five. In the same way, some think one day is more holier than other days, while another thinks that every day is a day alike. The controversy was not only about diets, but it was about days, as I shared. There were those that assisted that you had to worship on Saturday, the traditional Sabbath, and, and that is the Jewish day of worship, even today. Others said it would take place on the first day, the resurrection day, the Sunday. And as Christians, that's the day we do. When people want to argue about it, I say every day is a day that we should be worshiping the Lord. The Jehovah Witnesses and some of their strong um, traditional faiths believe that you really can lose your faith by worshiping on, on, on Sunday goes on and and what i don't understand how religious systems miss stuff like the next sentence okay these are not these are not my words okay this is what the bible says you should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable okay there is the word of god explaining that right down in front of all of us as simple as possible and yet people will argue all day long on those kind of things Most of these issues cause division in the body are those that are not clearly spelled out in the word. Their options, their perspectives that people have. We have to remember always to give each other great freedom to allow them to be persuaded by the Holy Spirit in their own minds and their own convictions. 
Again, not about sin, because sin is clear. Those who worship the Lord, verse 6, on a special day, do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food, do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating it. He, we really shouldn't put a piece of food in our mouth without thanking God. We really shouldn't. It puts a, it does, it's not that he needs the gratification of that. It puts us in the right place to understand there are places in the world where there's not drinking water. There are places in the world where people don't go to a restaurant and, and sit down under a meal. There are places in the world where people don't know if there's another meal coming. It, it's always, and then today, when third world countries are coming into America and serving our food without the same standards that we have, it's not a bad idea to ask God to protect you from the food you're eating. Lord, thank you. For the believer that sits down and says, Lord, thank you for this food as they pull out their pulled pork sandwich. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. Lord, thank you. I don't have to clog my gut with that pork as I sit down and eat my tofu burger and Brussels sprouts. For all you vegans, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Actually, my neighbors went and she made me this marinara sauce and it was really good. Paul tells us both are right in what doing what their conscience tells them to do. They're both right. Leave each other alone. Verse seven. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord in the things that we do. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both over the living and of the dead. Paul emphasizes that we should become more like the Lord in our actions, in our lives as his people. We test things by the example of the way that he lived when he walked on this earth. Verse 10. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on one another believers, on another believer? In other words, why do you write off your brother or sister who doesn't see things the way you see them? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Every Christian will one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 through 13, 3, 13 through 15 tells us not to be judged for our sin at that place, but to be given awards for which has been done for the Lord's glory and obedience to him. But until that day, we can't know the motives of other people. That's why Paul says not to judge people's motives but we can look for fruit in their life, and we should. Verse 12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Do you know who you're gonna give an account to when you stand before God? You're not gonna give it to that relative you can't get along with. You're not gonna give account to your neighbor. You're not gonna give account to that person that crashed your car. You're not gonna give an account to anyone that treated you poorly. You're not gonna give an account for anybody else but yourself. You will not stand before God and say, but they did this and that's why I did that. There's not a person that will be allowed to do that. No one in front of you, no one behind you. Everyone will give an account for themselves, not for their sins, but for what they did with the possessions the Lord gave them, the opportunities he gave them. He opened all these things for us for ministry and the gifts he gives us spiritually are all to be used for his kingdom everything else will be burned in the fire all this stuff all this stuff will have no meaning what we did with the resources God has given us are the only things that will count when we stand before him puts things in perspective doesn't it now, it doesn't matter if you have stuff, if the stuff you have is used for the kingdom. 
If the stuff you use is to use for other people and to help other people and share with other people, stuff is a great reward and a great blessing for those things. But if all of your stuff is for you and you alone, you gotta weigh out what you're doing with your stuff. You know, after Paul was caught up in heaven in 2 Corinthians 12 too, he said, from here on out, my goal is to win the prize. Nothing else has meaning to me other than finishing well. When I got to see heaven, Paul says, I don't know if I was alive or if I died, but when I saw the vision of heaven and what heaven is, everything else paled before me. Nothing else had value to me. Everything I was gonna do after that point was gonna be for the treasures of heaven. We need that perspective in our lives. Verse 13. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble at all. The strong Christian has spiritual knowledge, but if they don't practice love, the knowledge will hurt the weaker Christian. Knowledge must be balanced with love. Everything must be balanced with love. You can tell somebody what they're doing is wrong, and if you tell them in love, they will grow. They will grow. They will know. They may not always like what they hear, but if it's done in love, they will grow. I want you to think about this. Little children are afraid of dark and think there's something that's hiding in the closet. Parents know that the little children are safe, but their knowledge alone cannot assure or comfort that child. You can never argue a child into losing its fear. When the parent sits at the side of the bed and they talk lovingly to the child and assure them that everything is safe, then the child can finally go to sleep and finally can be reassured. Knowledge plus love helps a weaker person. And we all know weaker people. We know people that haven't been able to get rid of alcohol or drugs or a language or truth or we know people that have not grown in those areas yet. And mocking them, making fun of them, telling them that it's not there or it's not gonna change their life. Loving them, accepting them, sharing the victories of losing those sins in their life is how they'll grow. Verse 14, I know and I'm convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in itself is wrong to eat. Now again, remember, this is a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Paul had been a legalist in the strictest sense of the word. And after spending time with Jesus, Galatians 1.17, Paul returned from the desert. And in that verse, we can see he becomes the champion of liberty. He becomes acceptant to everyone. Now, he doesn't accept outright sin. Jesus ate with the sinners. You know, well, people want to use excuse to live ungodly lifestyle. Well, Jesus, you know, went with those people. He went with them, but he went to bring love to them, to save them, and to save them from those lifestyles. Now, he goes on to tell us, but if something, if someone believes it's wrong, then for that person, it is wrong. Paul said, personally, I'm persuaded there's nothing unclean in itself. But for those who esteem something to be unclean for them, it's unclean to them. I love this because Charles Hayden Spurgeon, one of the big Christian people of the world, could not understand how Joseph Parker, another gigantic Christian teacher, could go to the theater and watch plays. Parker, on the other hand, came down on Spurgeon saying he couldn't understand how Spurgeon could smoke those cigars. Both of these men were powerful preachers who were greatly used by the Lord and yet had a public fight. Now it goes on to tell us that Spurgeon finally gave up smoking his cigars later because in the London Times he saw a full page article that said, this is a cigar that Charles Spurgeon smokes. 
But you could just see two people picking on two things that have nothing to do with eternity and causing conflict. People are often shocked and appalled by how someone else could do something that they don't do and totally be blind to what they're doing themselves. And we know that's true. Verse 15. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you're not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. You know, it, it, it's a hard one because it's so easy to go, I, I, I have freedom here, you know? I have freedom to have a whiskey sour. You know, I, I do. But if I'm with someone who's an alcoholic and they look at me and go, well, if he could do it, I could do it. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to do that to that person when I know that for something that I probably could do without even a problem, I've never had a problem. I grew up in an Italian family. We didn't have a meal without a drink, but I, I've never had a problem with drinking. I could have one and not have one for five years, but I'm not going to sit at the yacht club and drink because the time that I wasn't a pastor, when I was going from one church to the other, I had a glass of wine with my dad and Ronnie and half a dozen people commented that the pastor was drinking wine. Um, and there were a lot of people in there that, that, that shouldn't be drinking. So I kind of learned that I don't want to do something that's gonna stumble somebody else. And that's what Paul's saying here. Now, your own convictions and what you wanna do with this, but I don't wanna stumble someone else. It's not worth it to me. I told this story years ago, but it, it was such a, a, a vivid illustration to this. My dad was one of the most powerful men I've ever known. And back in his day, water skier, just an amazing water skier. And they used to water ski side by side and they would pick up their 250 pound friend and put him up on their shoulder or the girls and they would water ski them on their shoulders. And when they started water skiing, they were water skiing behind these 14 foot boats with 50, 50 horsepower mercs. And the boat would hardly get itself out of the water. So if you wanted to pull a water skier, the only way you could get out is you had to lay over the water ski, drag your foot behind you, and stay down till the motor got going. And then once it got planing, then you could slowly come up. And if you came up too quick, you would start sinking back down again. And you just had to let it get going until you could go. Well, when they got a little more powerful boats, they thought it'd be fun to see how many people they could get up behind the boat. And they literally, at Lake Tullock, got 10 people behind uh, um, an inboard outboard one day but the way they did it was that the better water skiers stayed down and and the, the weaker water skiers could get up quicker and then as they got more speed and more speed the stronger water skiers would start to come up and start to come up and start to come up and my dad was always the last one he would stay down there the whole time so that the weaker guys could get up, and then my dad would stand up, and then they got a, they got a record out there. When we used to go to Tullock, nobody was at Tullock. Today, you can't find a place on the lake. But um, that's, I thought about that. The stronger skier sacrificed himself so that the weaker skiers could get up. And I thought, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Same thing holds in our, in our spiritual life. You might be freer and faster and stronger than your brothers and sisters in Christ. But, but keep in mind who you're working with and who you are with. We're linked together. Don't do something that's going to cause a weaker skier not to be able to get out of the water. We're all the family of Christ. And love is what we live by. Verse 16. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of the living life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it's wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. I, so many times preachers get up and they talk about what they believe. I've had people tell me, well, every church has a different thought of what the Bible says. If they would just read the Bible for what it says, 
Pastors don't have to give their opinion. They just have to give the opinion of what's being said. Here we see that both the stronger believer and the weaker believer both need to grow. They both need to grow. The stronger believer many times needs to grow in love, otherwise they become harsh or a Pharisee. The weaker believer needs to grow in knowledge so they don't fall weak to things. So long as a brother or sister are weak in faith, we must lovingly deal with them in their immaturity. But if we really love them, we'll help them to grow. It's wrong for a Christian to remain immature, having a weak conscience. Someone should not be doing the same things 20 years after they became a Christian. There's another illustration. I I, I steal all of these and I love them. This is from the home that might help us understand what's involved here. When a child comes into a home as a baby, everyone has to change. Mothers and fathers have to be careful not to leave scissors or knives or anything dangerous within reach. But as a child matures, it's possible for the parents to adjust the rules of the home and deal with them in a more adult fashion. It's natural for a child to stumble when they're learning to walk. But if an adult consistently stumbles like a child Something's not right there. Something's not right there. They're not growing. We're to stay away from anything that causes someone to stumble. Be careful with the liberties you enjoy. Church, we need to have balance. Verse 22. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God if that's the situation. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty over doing something they've decided is right. Again, I keep repeating, we're not talking about what God calls sin. Verse 23. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you're going ahead and doing it. For if you're not following your conscience or your convictions, if you do anything you believe is not right, you're sinning. The Bible tells us, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 133.1. What does this mean? Is the worship team heads up? Augustine, the great preacher, summed it up best when he said, in essentials, there must be unity. In non-essentials, there must be liberty. But all things, there must be charity. I pray that God gives us the wisdom to walk in both liberty and in love and to balance those things. Like I said, it's a really good time in the church because there doesn't, doesn't seem to be a conflict in the world. And I looked at this message and I thought, man, Lord, there's been times that we should have been teaching this. But actually, if you think about it, this is a good time to be teaching this so that we don't run into those things. It's been an honor to be your pastor all these years. Um, you know, this family, this family is as great as any family you can have, you know, and to have people that love the Lord, that are like-minded. What a blessing in your life. You look at the world that we live in and so many people don't have that. They don't have that and and I I hurt for them. Um, We should be contagious. We absolutely should be contagious in the world that we live in because they don't have what we have. So I thank you for your unity. I thank you for your support. I thank you that, um, that you're a church that, that gets it. And, and again, as a pastor, it's an honor. God bless you guys. Would you stand? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May your week with him be sweet and tender. Father, quiet us down, please. Let's spend more time with you. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Don't allow us to get up in the morning, Lord. Don't let these feet touch the ground until we've asked you for that. We need it, Lord. We love you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.